Cosmological inflation is our best idea of what happened in the very early universe, and it's a period of time immediately after the Big Bang when the universe got very big very quickly. There's a whole bunch of reasons, like at least three, why we think this period of inflation had to happen, but let's start by talking about the mind-boggling scales and really big numbers we need to properly describe inflation. Alan Guth, one of inflation's proposers, or discoverers, or inventors, I guess depending on your philosophical bend, once described inflation as a prequel to the conventional Big Bang picture. While this is quite a nice soundbite, I think it somewhat hides the fact that the Big Bang still happens before this period of inflation, but inflation happens before every other known event in the history of the universe. The inflationary expansion that happened was very different to the kind of expansion that the universe usually experiences. We know that the universe is still getting bigger. Almost every galaxy we can see is moving away from us and at an incredible speed. It's not just that every galaxy happens to have some speed that's carrying it away from us, but rather the very fabric of space itself is expanding. This expansion of space carries all the galaxies away from us, and the further away a galaxy is from us, the faster it's moving away. This is called Hubble's Law, and even though it can make galaxies recede away from us faster than the speed of light, this is nothing compared to the speed of inflation. The popular analogy for Hubble's Law is to stick some galaxies on a balloon and then blow it up. The galaxies on the surface of the balloon, which represent space-time, move away from each other as the balloon expands, and the further apart two galaxies are, the faster they move away from each other. This gives a nice representation of how the galaxies move away from each other. They're carried by the fabric of space-time itself. The galaxies themselves don't expand because locally their gravity is strong enough to overcome the expansion of space and hold them together, but the space in between the galaxies does expand. That's actually why for this analogy we draw the galaxies separately and stick them onto the balloon, because if you just drew the galaxies on the surface of the balloon they would expand as well, and that's really not what's happening here. However, one shortcoming of this analogy is it gives the impression that space is expanding into something. The 2D surface of the balloon expands into the three-dimensional room that I'm stood in, but in reality, as far as we know, the four dimensions of space-time, that's three dimensions of space and one of time, are all that exists, and the universe isn't embedded in some higher dimensional space. So when the universe expands, it simply expands into itself. This is hard for us to imagine, but it's important to remember. So, since the universe is expanding as we go forward in time, it makes sense that if we go backwards in time, the universe was smaller. The further in time we go back, the smaller the universe was. We can see this in our balloon analogy if we just play it backwards. The universe gets smaller earlier in time. Eventually, if we go back in time far enough, there must have been a point where the entire contents of the universe were contained in an unfathomably small volume. We kind of then just assume that this is the beginning of everything, the beginning of space and time, and we define it as the Big Bang. If we define time to be represented by the letter T, then the Big Bang happens at t equals zero. It's tempting for our tiny human brains to kind of imagine the Big Bang happening at a single point in space, and afterwards the entire universe sort of streaming away from this one point. But in reality, the Big Bang happened everywhere in the universe at once. It's just that at that point, the universe was all very close together. It was never really a single point, just a ridiculously small volume. Although if the universe really is infinite, then it always has been infinite. So the Big Bang was a lot closer together, but it was still infinitely large. Try and get your head around that one. Throughout this video, I'm gonna to refer to the observable universe rather than just the universe, mm -hmm. because we don't really know what's beyond our cosmic horizon. So it's hard to talk about that in any concrete manner. So if the universe is infinite, I'm just talking about the small patch that we can see. Even though the speed at which other galaxies are moving away from us now can be extremely large, even faster than the speed of light in some cases, this is nothing compared to the speed at which the universe expanded during inflation. Our best theories of inflation tell us that it began about 10 to the power of minus 36 seconds after the Big Bang, and it had all finished by about 10 to the power of minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang. It's almost impossible for us to really understand how short that period of time is, but we just need to know it's really, really short. During the accelerated exponential expansion of inflation, the small speck that will have grown into our observable universe had to increase in size by at least a factor of 10 to the power of 26 in each spatial direction. So this means the volume of the universe had to increase by at least a factor of 10 to the power of 78. Again, this is an absurdly huge number that's really difficult to really understand. In fact, this number is so huge that in the 13.7 or so billion years since the end of inflation, 
the universe has expanded by approximately the same factor again. As a side note, did you know the name for the number 10 to the power of 78 is one quinvigintillion? I did not. Also, numbers only have a special name like that if they're a multiple of a thousand, so I guess it's a good job 78 divides by 3. I keep saying at least or about when I'm talking about how long inflation lasts or how much it expanded the universe, and that's because we don't really know the specific numbers for either of these things. There's a minimum amount that inflation needs to have expanded the universe in order to explain what we see today, but it actually could have gone on for way, way longer. That's why different sources tend to give pretty similar, but sometimes different numbers for these things. So here, I'll keep talking about the minimum amount of inflation we need, but just remember that really, it could have happened for way, way longer. And in fact, it could actually still be happening in other parts of the universe, but that's a story for another day. Now, to expand the universe by such a large amount in such a short time isn't easy, and it would have been a very hot and dense and violent time in the universe's history. The temperature of the universe at this point would have been much too high for any structure to have existed. So no molecules or atoms, and certainly nothing more complex like stars or planets. It would have just been a hot soup of radiation, what we call a quark-gluon plasma. And it was just this plasma being stretched bigger and bigger by the inflationary expansion. Rather than thinking about inflationary expansion like a balloon, Think a bit more of a popcorn kernel. Our observable universe starts out as a small speck, and then suddenly and rapidly gets a lot bigger very quickly. Nothing new is being created, either in the popcorn situation or inflation, just what was already there is getting stretched and spread out a lot. Once again, the analogy here isn't perfect, and I'll explain why in just a second, but it's much closer to what would have happened than a balloon expanding. The observable universe we see today would have grown out of a speck of space that was incredibly tiny. It would have had a diameter of 10 to the power of minus 29 meters. This is absurdly small. It's actually about 10 orders of magnitude smaller than the diameter of an up quark, which is the smallest particle in the standard model of particle physics. At the end of inflation, the patch of space that will grow into our observable universe would have been about the size of the volume that I can fit in my hands like this. Imagine that, the whole universe in your hands. This volume then continues to expand after inflation and grows into the observable universe we see today. The expansion after inflation is much slower and proceeds according to Hubble's law, but it does keep expanding. Now there's actually something called dark energy, which is once again accelerating the expansion of the universe today. This could be similar to inflation, but I don't want to talk about that today, so we'll leave that for another video. Going back to the popcorn analogy I tried to use, we can see that the kernel doesn't increase in size quite enough for this to be perfect. If the kernel had popped and increased in volume by this factor of 10 to the power of 78, the minimum increase of the size of the universe during inflation, then I would have ended up with a piece of popcorn that was about 600 times larger than the entire Milky Way galaxy. So, why do we think this period of inflation had to happen in the early universe? It sounds like some pretty preposterous physics to expand the seething hot early universe by such an absurdly large amount in such an absurdly short amount of time. The standard hot big bang model of the universe has a few problems, and an early period of inflation in the history of the universe solves a bunch of these problems in a pretty neat way. Historically, there were three main problems with the big bang model, which led to the proposal of inflation in the 1970s by Alan Guth, Andre Linde, and Alexei Starobinsky. These problems are known as the horizon problem, the flatness problem, and the monopole problem, and they relate to observations in the universe we live in that simply can't be explained by the classic Big Bang ideas. Actually, we now know that inflation does much more for us than just solve these three old problems, and I would say that solving these problems is now no longer the most important thing inflation does for us. As cool as this story is, that's for a future video, and for now, we'll stick to the three historical problems. I'm going to do detailed videos about each of these in turn, so I'm just going to give you a quick summary of each of the three problems here. Firstly, the horizon problem is basically the fact that when we look out into the universe as far as we can, we see a faint radiation called the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB, and all of this radiation is basically exactly the same temperature. This might not sound that shocking, but this is actually pretty weird, because the CMB was released at exactly the same time throughout the entire universe, and at the time it was released, the universe was too big to have settled down to one uniform temperature. Assuming that the universe hasn't randomly had exactly the same temperature in all of space since the beginning, this means that the CMB radiation shouldn't have time to equilibrate to one temperature. It wasn't even close either. At the time it was released, the CMB was made up of about 450,000 causally disconnected patches. So this means we could expect the temperature of the CMB to fluctuate a lot between these different patches, 
and the fact that we see it as one temperature is pretty weird if we don't have inflation. A period of cosmic inflation solves this problem in a pretty neat way. It simply allows the universe to be much more compact immediately after the Big Bang. This means that the patch that grows into our observable universe was a lot smaller than we thought, so it has time to mix and settle and equilibrate. It then expands rapidly during inflation, leaving us with a universe that looks uniform, but also looks like it was too large to ever do so. But inflation explains how it did. Secondly, the flatness problem. This comes from the fact that when we measure how spatially flat or curved the observable universe is, we see that it looks incredibly flat. So it looks more like a sheet of paper than the surface of a sphere. Of course, both of those surfaces I just mentioned were two-dimensional, and the universe has three spatial dimensions. So maybe I should say that the universe looks like it's more of a massive 3D box, rather than the 3D surface of a 4D hypersphere. Personally, I find that much harder to imagine than the first thing I said, but maybe you prefer it. Anyway, if the universe starts off as anything other than perfectly flat, it should get more and more curved as it expands. But inflation kind of lets us dilute away any curvature by expanding so fast. For example, take a look at this circle. If you look at any part of it, it looks pretty curved, right? But if I blow it up suddenly, like inflation would, then all of a sudden, each part of it looks like a straight line. It looks flat, even though it's actually curved on much larger scales. Inflation does the same thing, but to the entire universe. It's the same as how, on the patch you're stood on on Earth, it looks flat. But if you zoom out much further, you can see that you're stood on the surface of a sphere. So maybe the universe is the same. Our observable universe looks flat to us, but that could just be because we're in a small patch of it. Maybe if you could somehow zoom out, it would look curved on much larger scales. The final problem is called the monopole problem, and it simply asks, where are all the magnetic monopoles? These are strange objects that we would expect to form during the Big Bang and early universe, but when we look for them, we don't see any. These are weird objects that we would expect to form in the Big Bang and early universe, and they're basically just one pole of a magnet on their own. But we've never actually seen one of these. As far as we know, they don't seem to exist. However, there's no known reason why they shouldn't exist, we've just never found one. So the question is, where are they all? Have no fear. Inflation answers this with that they're somewhere else. I diluted them away, don't worry about it. Imagine some monopoles existing in the universe right after the Big Bang. Now you just take whatever space is in between them and inflate it enough to make up our entire observable universe. And that's exactly how inflation explains the fact that we don't see any magnetic monopoles. Inflation literally just takes whatever space doesn't have a magnetic monopole and inflates it enough so that it could account for our entire observable universe. It doesn't say that magnetic monopoles can't or don't exist, it just says that if they do, they're somewhere else and they're not our problem. Of course, inflation does still have some open questions. Most obviously, how on earth could you do all this? How do you get so much expansion in such a short amount of time? Surely that needs an obscene amount of energy. Where does that all come from? In general, inflation trades three problems for one. While it solves the three historical problems we just talked about, it leaves us with the problem of how the hell did inflation happen and what's that all about? There's a lot more detail we could go into for everything we've talked about here. So let's do this again sometime. It might be fun. Until then, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.